we go. The live stream is working. All the speakers are here. Time to start. Um, thanks for joining, Nia Tina, everyone. Uh, great to see you. I hope you had a lovely weekend. Uh, we're starting this week with great news, and that is that our YouTube channel has surpassed the 1,000 subscribers. Um, thank you, everyone, for making that happen. It's quite exciting to see that um, what we do here every week and once a month is actually appreciated. So thank you very much for that. Right, without further ado, we promised Michelle he can go fast after we bumped him last week. <laughs> so I'm going to hold my promise. Um, take it away, Michelle. Boom. There we go. Brain pathology recapitulates physiology and network meta-analysis. Um, in communication biology, just published last week, also two weeks ago. Um, I've been very impressed by this paper. Basically, what they did, they compare resting state functional networks with function task related fMRI, um, um, task related fMRI ICA, so networks that are de derived from task related approach, which has been done previously by Stephen Smith in 2009 in PNS, but they added to that uh, pathologies, uh, neuropsychiatric and uh, neurological disorders. And so what they've been able to show is basically when you do uh, an ICA decomposition of task-related uh, activations, or you do an ICA decomposition voxel-based morphometry in a patient with neurodegenerative disease, you end up with similar networks. Uh -huh. Meaning that the different element constituting uh, the network organization of function and damage seems to overlap. Um, so of course here they did it only with 20 components and I find it pretty clever the way they uh, represented here the same uh, analysis according to decomposition in more actually networks. So here they did 20, here 45 and 70, and they have this gorgeous like 3D uh, representation of how many of uh, the networking percentage were significantly co cross-correlated, whether this is VBM, ICA, or functional ICA. Okay, so in some they replicate this finding with 20 components on the left and 20 components on the right uh, with uh, more components, 45 and 70 components here, and they show that that works even if they go further in the decomposition of the signal. So the first result of the study is really showing that the organization of functions, the way you have different function of the brain is the same that the way you have a variance in your uh, gray matter concentration, mm -hmm. suggesting that disease progress along functional networks and not across functional networks. Then the try to look at uh, uh, the entropy of disease, which is like, are there some networks that tends to overlap with more disease than others? Um, so by entropy, they mean uh, complexity, which here they're showing that, for example, for the silence, the ventral intention, and the central executive networks, you're more likely to have this network damage, whatever the neurogenerative or neuropsychiatric disease that you have. While some of the networks, such as the anterior DMN, posterior DMN, or hand sensory motor networks, you have less pathologies that can involve those networks. Okay. Another step of analysis here was to uh, make the link between the different networks they found and the different functions, the different net, the different networks that they found and the different uh, pathologies and task-related activation here, which is a useful table if you want to interpret functional networks or the link between uh, this uh, resting state network and the pathology related to the function. And uh, finally, they do an analysis on two, like the level of uh, metabolic 
uh, use of the brain and they show that the higher the metabolism in the brain, the more function you will be likely to have in this area and uh, more likely you will have different kind of neurodegenerative disease. So it all centered on to high metabolic areas of highly functional and use area in different functions and the most likely to be damaged across different uh, pathologies of the brain. Um, and that's about it. And I really like this paper because it link up together uh, the functional organization of the brain with its connectivity derived from uh, functional connectivity and a network pathology. And it answer like a, a, a question, something that you know we were saying, which is you take neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer, it looks like it's really progressively destroying the episodic memory system. You take another disease like primary progressive aphasia, it looks like it's progressively destroying the language system as if those diseases were following networks. And this paper is really the one that is demonstrating that. So bravo to the authors, I uh, really enjoyed that. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, this is indeed an exciting paper. Are there questions in the room? Yes, Leah, I can see you have a question. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for presenting. And um, when you were explaining the paper, you uh, remember me uh, about uh, Philly et al. 2009, I think, when they did uh, kind of the same thing, but uh, um, using healthy uh, controls for the state uh, of analysis and then compared to the neural generation uh, cortical atrophy, and uh, so it was the kind of the same parallelism, uh, but not, but here, if I understood well, the uh, the fMRI was uh, on the patients too, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here you're looking at disease of the brain and how disease follow networks, and different different uh, disease actually follow different networks. So you can see here, I'm sorry for the complexity of the table, but there is no way to uh, display better this three-dimensional thing where you have the brain map behavior. This is task-related activation. Here you have the uh, uh, neurological diagnosis, and here you have like the different functional networks. You can see how you have high high relationship between those three. Okay, thank you. Lovely. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, Michelle, did they talk at all about mechanisms for how it could go along networks? I know there's been discussion in Alzheimer's research that maybe prion disease is following networks, you know, through some kind of like facilitated pathway by activation, but I haven't followed up on that in recent years, and I was wondering if they talked about that at all. So, so I actually prepared it for last week, so I, I kind of forgot part of the discussion now, but uh, as far as I remember, so there is this main thing about like disease following networks, but then like the discussion is really centering on to the higher energy cost and metabolism and how high metabolic area are more fragile or, or you know, sensitive to disease. And, uh, and that's why they, they actually are the most correlated with across disease and have the higher relationship with entropy of disease. Uh, but that's the center of the, the discussion uh, here. Cool, thanks. Lovely. Have it? Yeah, thank yes, you. Yes, just can you go get back to the, um, the figure where it's about the metabolism? I, I didn't get, yeah, this one I didn't get. So can you go again and see because there is three axes and uh, it's kind of difficult to to get it. All right, so um, they look at the uh, uh, level of uh, uh, metabolism used and uh, here like the, the percentage of maximum entropy, which is like um, um, how much do you 
load on different behavior or different disease, different behavior in blue, different disease in orange. So the higher you are, the uh, more pathology will be, it will, will be touched in this area. And the, uh, lower, the higher you are on the blue, the more domain of function will be touched. And what we see is that uh, the, the high overlap for pathology or the high overlap for functional domains are well related with a high metabolic cost okay. in the brain. Okay. okay, makes sense. Thank you. Anyone I didn't see? No, I think we're good for now. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, and thanks for bringing the paper a week later. Very much appreciated. Right, we're going to move on to the next paper. And I'm very pleased to welcome Catherine, who uh, will present for the first time in your retina. That's exciting for us. Um, and quite interesting. We're going to learn everything about the Chong, for those of you who followed us on Twitter. Um, Catherine, if you just share your screen. Sure. Um, and I didn't know how much to prepare, so how long should I talk for? Um, just, just present the paper as in what's interesting, what got you excited, what is okay. it? Well, 45 minutes. Okay, good. Because I made a lot of slides. I got nervous when Michelle did his, I was like, oh God, was I supposed to talk for five minutes? Okay. She has a tendency oh. to make our speakers nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, cool. But unrelated to how long, and um, if everyone could just share the link so people can uh, follow the publications um, at their own time as well, and I can copy them over on YouTube as well, so they know what we're looking at. Thank you. If you want to take it away, go for it. All right. Okay, so um, we were talking about on Twitter about uh, measures of um, how chunky a brain is or how uh, globular to use these authors' terminology. So um, Michelle let me know that we would be discussing this paper at uh, Neurochino, and so I learned about Neurochino. So thanks so much uh, to Michelle and the rest of you for inviting me to talk. Um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, an interesting paper that to me is interesting because I've been following some of the research uh, on paleoneurology for a few years now um, and how it relates to human brain evolution. So. Um, in this particular paper, um, they're interested in understanding sort of the globularity of the human brain. And actually, they don't really define it, but I think basically they mean that um, human brains um, are taller and um, kind of more compressed and rounded than um, Neanderthal brains and the brains of other um, hominids. And even if you look at, at chimpanzees or other primate species, their brains are not as, as tall and sort of uh, spherical as humans are. So. Um, there's been uh, interest in this and A, how it came about, why human uh, homo sapiens evolved this brain shape, um, and also whether it has behavioral implications and whether it's related to um, modifications to, to genes, if there was selective pressure that, that shaped this and, and what that selective pressure was about. So this paper tries to look at all of those things, but really the, the, the method that they're using is um, doing um, computed tomography to, to, to kind of um, analyze the vertices of the surface of the brain in humans and um, other hominin uh, an ancestors and compare them. So they're really only able to do sort of a morphometric analysis, but they are interested in sort of tying this into other research that looks at genetics, that looks at um, the emergence of behavioral modernity. So that's the gist of the, of the paper. Um, and they're also especially interested in how this emerged developmentally, and they bring up um, previous research that, that seems to indicate that the human brain shape and, and the, the novelness of it emerges early. So it seems to occur towards um, the later uh, weeks of gestation and after birth. So there's kind of a period of uh, brain growth in humans that's um, characterized by this sort of puffy shape that starts to emerge very early on. And so there's these sort of trajectories where people have tried to map what they think um, this, this process looks like in humans that's here in blue and in um, Neanderthals in, in red here. And so there's some, there's some, some decent evidence already that it emerges early. Um, and another way to look at this, oh, it's covered up my notes, sorry about that. 
um, is to look at, uh, to compare the brains um, in terms of uh, areas that have shrunk and areas that have expanded. So here on the right, um, you have a uh, human brain is on the, this right hand um, half and the Neanderthal brain is on the left hand, uh, half. And so the red is areas that are smaller in, in that species and the green is areas that are, are larger. Um, and what's important to note here in this figure is that it also, it's not just the cranium itself, it's also other components of the skull. So the mid face has differences between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and the jaw does as well. Um, and one way to kind of visualize this is, this is from a different paper, uh, this uh, Ponce de Leon paper, um, where they have this nice animation that goes between um, Neanderthal and human. I kind of wish it was slower, but you get the picture. Um, so it seems sort of like a global change in just the organization of the face um, and the cranium. Um, and I think what, what inspired this paper, it appears, is a very early um, Homo sapiens um, fossil from 300,000 years ago. Um, and they have what appears to be sort of a Neanderthal style brain organization. You'll notice that the, the forehead, for example, is very sloped and the brain appears long and almost seems to have like an occipital bun like you might find in a Neanderthal. Um, so they were interested in this um, because it suggests that essentially this modern human brain uh, shape um, emerged over the course of evolution of Homo sapiens once the species emerged. And it wasn't um, something that um, was what Homo sapiens uh, initially started out with. So they wanted to know when did this globularity, as they call it, emerge? And so on the right hand side here, I just have, um, this is from, I think they're supplemental figures, um, their comparison of different, of Neanderthals, humans, and uh, Homo erectus to show you how it appears that other hominins previous to, to Homo sapiens really were kind of conserving this sort of more sloping uh, brain shape and did not have uh, the human brain shape. Um, and so they were interested in looking at across species, what were the patterns of brain shape and also across time. Um, and I think basically their hypothesis is that both across species and across time, you see a change over to this more globular brain shape. Um, and they use principal components analysis to look at this, uh, look at these. And let me see, did I? Yeah, sorry. And they, they're, I should mention, they looked at Homo sapiens fossils um, and for, from starting as early as the, the Moroccan um, uh, uh, specimen that they mentioned, um, all the way to more recent ones that look very, very modern. Um, they have eight Homo erectus, eight Homo neanderthalensis. They had two um, Homo heidelbergensis, although it looks like species designation is a little bit disputed in the literature. I don't have any comments on that. I don't know if anybody here is, um, if this is their field. So if they do, please chime in. Um, and then they have a lot of human samples. So they have 89 modern or present day human samples and they selected from a, a wide variety of locations. So they have a really diverse human sample, which I think is really good. Um, so here's their, their analysis of variation of total um, endocranial shape. Um, so one important thing to note here is um, they registered them all to the same size. They, they, they corrected them to the same size because they didn't want size to be impacting um, this principal components analysis. They just wanted the shape. Um, and they identify kind of, um, so in this, this, the yellow is Homo erectus, the red is Neanderthals, um, and the blue are different humans at different geologic ages. So uh, this triangle here, one is the earliest geologic age, and then two is the middle one, and three is, is, is the more recent 10,000 years ago uh, Homo sapiens. And then as you see, it overlaps with their, their present day human sample. Um, so they're showing there's this movement along principal component axis one um, in humans that we're not seeing um, and these other, that, that's a, a novel movement in, in sort of shape space that we don't see in these other um, species. Um, and they're arguing that basically the modern day human uh, brain shape variation reached sometime between 100,000 and 35,000 years ago. Now that's a really big, it's a broad, time period, but that, you know, that's what their data support at this point. Um, and they're, to be more specific, it's this geologic age is explaining 21% of, or 22% of shape variants. Um, another important thing to note is that they did not find any geographic um, component of the shape vari variation. So it seemed to be, you know, 
mainly driven by um, time. Um, and this is just another way to visualize these, this pattern of change um, that they're seeing where essentially the brain is getting taller and narrower and this, the uh, cerebellum is kind of getting um, pushed more um, forward, I would say, and underneath uh, the brain. Um, so this is just in their supplemental, they had these really nice um, um, uh, sort of visualizations of what's happening over geologic time in Homo sapiens. So I thought those were work it, worth looking at. And I think it really helps too, because when you say globular, you know, what do you mean? Um, and they talk later in the paper, they're really talking about the sort of increase in the height that seems to be especially focused around the parietal areas. Um, and you kind of also have these temporal lobes that kind of push forward um, so that, to help you get a visualization of what exactly is happening. Oh. All right, here they did the same analysis again. And from what I can understand, they just in this time didn't remove the shape, but didn't remove the size variable. They also included size and shape. Um, I don't know. Honestly, I, to me, this made it a little more confusing. I, I think what they were trying to, to demonstrate here is that size and shape um, sort of had different patterns of change. And I think they wanted to illustrate that size was not playing any kind of role in this change in shape and just, and just show it in a different way. And also show that Neanderthals um, maintain, you know, kept increasing the size of their brain, but they, did, they completely maintained the original sort of archaic shape that we found in other hominins. So I think that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, and again, here, geologic age is explaining roughly the same amount percentage of shape variance that we saw in the previous analysis. So, so I guess you could say that's, that's helpful. Um, and yet in archaic homo, we don't see um, a, a similar change um, that corresponds to geologic age. Um, actually, I'm going to skip this because I think this is actually a little bit confusing. Um, okay, so to be more specific about what these, these shape changes uh, look like, um, it mainly seems to focus on the sort of anterior and middle cranial uh, fossa. So, um, and they want to also be clear that this globularization is occurring after we've achieved essentially modern day or present day um, Homo sapiens brain size. So they're kind of arguing there's two step change. There's a change in the increase in brain size that we see in Homo sapiens. And, but then there's also the second step change, which is the change um, in shape. Um, and so they mentioned this anterior and middle cranial fossa seem to be the main place where there's sort of a, a change in the geometry. Um, and they did briefly discuss the fact that this may reflect um, a response to changes in the face. Um, and I thought that was interesting because that's something that other authors have talked about, especially um, I think Emiliana Bruner has talked about it. I know uh, Bastier has talked about this quite a bit, um, that you can see this very nice um, correlation between as the mid face sort of retracts and the, um, that you see a corresponding more uh, globular uh, Homo sapiens brain. And so for some paleoneurologists, I think they might argue this is really driven by face chases, changes and jaw changes, and that it's not um, driven by cognitive uh, factors. And you know, it's, we obviously can't test that, but it, it's, it's interesting. Um, these authors, I think, are not as compelled by that argument. And they um, want to talk a little bit about what areas are, are getting, appear to be larger and taller and what that might uh, implicate. And so their argument is, well, we really are seeing these parietal bulging changes and these cerebellar changes. And so they talk a little bit about, you know, what the parietal lobes are for, which I think most of us know, which has to do with the dorsal visual pathway and um, visual spatial processing. Um, it's also involved in a lot of um, pathways that connect to the prefrontal cortex that are involved with language and tool use. So you could argue, you know, especially tool use that, you know, perhaps in this period of human evolution, there may have been selection for um, abilities that required um, parietal specific processes. Um, and they talk a little bit about the cerebellum and you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to, to connect that to this. Um, 
But I think one of the more compelling things uh, that, and I think they're right about, is there are shape changes in these areas that um, are unique to humans that are worth looking at. And I'm thinking specifically of the precuneus, which is something Emiliana Bruner has worked at showing that there's a lot of variation. A, the precuneus in humans is quite large, and B, there's a lot of variation in humans, which may suggest that there was a recent selection pressure that's not stabilized yet for a larger sort of medial um, medial side of this of these bridal bones, like the structures in the medial component of that. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, they also talk a little bit about what this might mean for looking back at the, the fossil record in terms of tool use and other behaviors. And it, can we find some kind of connection between when the step change was, cha was happening, when this globularization was happening and um, the emergence of what people call behavioral modernity. Um, and this isn't my area of expertise, so I'm happy to, to if people here have things to say about it. Um, I looked at some of the references they, they uh, referred to around this because their argument is essentially, um, this is a good uh, possibility for explaining the emergence of behavioral modernity in um, Homo sapiens, because they, they're sort of saying in this last 100,000 years when we see this globular brain emerge is when we see major components of um, human behavioral modernity. Um, and there are some people, so what is behavioral modernity? I'm not quite sure, but it, it has to do with the emergence of new tool technologies, more refined tool technologies and lithics. Um, and one of the authors mentions you know, uh, several other things like more travel, possibly trading between um, human populations, um, let's see, what else? Processing um, like food and other objects more, using pigment, et cetera. Um, I think this is a difficult uh, argument to make. And one of the citations they used actually argued that many of these behaviors are seen in hominid ancestors and are not unique to Homo sapiens and that it's not really fair to say that behavioral modernity is, is a suite of things that just happened like that. And that's how modern humans emerged. So I think it's kind of a, I think it's difficult to, to claim this, but it is interesting. And I could see, for example, it, I would be interested to see someone analyze the, the changes in globularity and maybe look specifically at tools because that is at least something that we have like a consistent fossil record of. And we could talk about the emergence of different tool assemblages. Um, it gets a little tricky because we know Neanderthals did some of these tool use, um, uh, tool manufacturing technologies as well. And there's there's debate sometimes about what, what tools belong to which group, but Maybe there's something there that could, could work. Um, so essentially their, their main conclusion is that this is a directional gradual change to increase globularity in, um, uh, in the evolution and emergence of, of modern day um, Homo sapiens. Um, and they, they encourage um, people to start looking more at how this connects to behavioral modernity and however you might define that and how it may connect to changes in brain development. And they, they make a pretty good case for looking at the genetics of brain development and how selection may have been um, shaped in human brains and have, we might find some genetic markers of this that have led to um, these changes in, into a globular shape, which I think is, is really interesting. And I would also be interested personally to see if you, people could also look for genetic markers of maybe facial development to try to get a, get a handle on is this driven by a cognitive mechanism or is this driven by some other kind of mechanical or other um, selection pressure that has to do with the face, whether it has to do with chewing or does it have to do with breathing? I don't know, but I, I, it was a lot of food for thought. So I thought it was a really interesting paper. So yeah, that's, that's what I have. Lovely, thank you very much. Super exciting indeed. And thanks mm -hmm. for preparing a sure. presentation for us. <laughs> um, personally, I thought the, the videos were absolutely stunning to yeah. really see the evolution from one to the other. Yeah. Um, right. I can already see questions in the room. So, Michelle. Thank you. I love it so much, really. And thank you for taking the time, like making all those slides. It really helps to understand. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I have so many questions. Though. I'll, I'll try to focus on the uh, and I want to discuss so many things with you, but um, I would like I'd like to focus just on the main one, where, uh, which is so you, they use a principal component analysis to simplify a little bit the change of shape and have a point of comparison across the different uh, human lineage species. I don't know how we gotta call it. Um, and, and so so when they did that, 
first is there like some form of like uh, triangles everybody's gonna love that uh that are appearing so that there is a form of trade-off between threats so you can have a brain that have too much that shape or not um did they try to look at how so many questions sorry uh, how yeah, no. each, each <laughs> axis of components relate to specific things in the shape no, um, I, yeah. Did they try to do three components and see in 3D how uh, does it distribute? Sorry. No, that's a really good question. And I, I didn't see it in the paper now. I'm wondering if it's buried in the supplemental um, because I don't know how they, also, I don't know how they selected just two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, then they could have done like a regression on each axis and see a little bit whether it's like, you know, the lateral bulging or like more like that is related to one component or another, just right. to help us have a better interpretation of like what those axes represent. Yeah, yeah. You know, just a linear regression uh, that would be, be so great. Be helpful, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good so, question. It, it is so cool. Has the data available? Can we play with it? Oh, that's a good question. I wonder if they. I don't think they make it available. They should, especially with the really nice human modern day human data set. Um, yeah. All right. That's that's yeah. That's about it. I'm gonna do. Anybody has other questions? Or can I? Carry on with. But we actually did have a bat on you picking up on the triangles. <laughs> I had I have two triangles as the best. Oh, Leah has a question. Yeah, take it away. Thank you. Yes, we, we, we see the triangles. Now, I would want to thank you a little bit of this um, uh, animation. And um, we talk a, a lot about the parietal lobe. I was thinking uh, we don't have any correlations with the frontal one, like there is an expansion there, or is just the parietal? Um, there is an ex like there is an ex uh, uh, there is a inferior to superior expansion you can see in this in this image in the in the frontal cortex as well. Um, I think the biggest change is in the parietal lobe, which is why um, they focus on that so much. But for sure. But the other complicated thing is that the, 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 this sort of geometric expansion is not related to a volumetric expansion. So it's, it's, it's just simply a shape change and not, not a volume change. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, it's, it's kind of question and comment. Uh, I think the figure two uh, with the the, the, the the principal component one is uh, one of the most um, interesting. Uh, yeah, not this, yeah, this one too, but the, the first one is, uh, yeah. is really, uh, but uh, yeah, there is kind of a gap between, so the problem with this kind of data, they don't have a lot for the first group. Yeah. They seem to, to have a gap between the, so the two and the three seems to be very close, but the, the one seems to be kind of dispersed and far, far away from the other two. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. difficult to, um, so it would be better to have more subjects, but yeah. Yeah, but. yeah absolutely. And it, it, yeah, it almost makes it look like it was it makes it look like from an evolutionary perspective that it was perhaps a rather strong selection pressure that made sort of this jump um, yeah. from these two different uh, states. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I was thinking, because we discussed about the paper, so I looked at, uh, I discussed a paper about the the genetics they, they, um, in this paper, the, I don't know the, uh, yeah, it's Anderco, I think, Anderco 2000. 21. Uh, they discuss about the age of the genetic variation uh, along the human lineage, and uh, they kind of try to find uh, gaps between, or not gaps, but period of time where they uh, they got a lot of changes in terms of genetics. So I don't know if this kind of uh, 
changes or big big period of changes can be uh, uh, can be de described of fine in this kind of analysis. So it will be interesting to see if that. So this is an evolution, but is it linear or kind of uh, bumpy? Uh, right. Uh, we don't know. Yeah, and I think. Um, I had it up here. The I thought also this this difference in developmental uh, shape in Neanderthals and and modern humans was pretty striking, yeah. and I think that that that's kind of what they're po pointing to is saying we're you know we're sort of expecting to see some kind of link or selective pressure, a genetic um, yeah. component to that, which is 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 pretty interesting. Um, I also like sometimes I just wonder, you know, how much, uh, you know, brains are pretty flexible, I think, in terms of dealing with deformed crania. So, you know, you wonder how much of this is really about other things about just bone structure that that are driving this. But, yeah. Um, yeah, because when you look at the at the, at the regions, the, the, the most uh, different region is the cerebellum, which is a very great region. And so, but always when we take, uh, we talk about evolution, it's about the frontal part and uh, stuff. But when you look at this picture, the, the most, the, the biggest changes are in the uh, cerebellum. So mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Yeah, it's always like, like eh, I don't know what to, <laughs> to make of that. I mean, you obviously need one, but I don't Yes. beyond that. So we actually any... had a question about the cerebellum over on YouTube, and that is whether the cerebellum is associated with working memory. That's a great question. Um... Yes, it is. And you can have a lesion in the cerebellum and have working memory impairment. Thanks, Michelle. I uh, don't have the reference handy, but I can put it on YouTube later if you want. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's one of those regions that we initially said, well, it's you know, it's it's motor, it's important for motor processing and, and timing especially, but more and more it's being implicated in language and all kinds of complex uh, cognitive abilities. So, um, uh, I had a question regarding like um, uh, that's really an open question, but the shape of the skull might be also changing due to customs, you know, where these people. Yeah. holding stuff on their head, making it like, making the skull like a lot flatter. We see it, you know, my daughter, she used to sleep, she she had a, a, a stiff neck, so she slept all the time on the same side and she started to have a flat bone on, on the side of her head that we had to adjust, you know, with, mm. with doctors. And uh, it, it, this happened and um, there's also this culture where they used to like uh, wrap their head and like deform their skull yeah, uh, to expand expand their mind, and this also has an impact on the shape of the skull. And must have like we're not phrenologists, but it must have like a lot of impact on the shape of the brain at some point. Um, yep. I don't know. What you yeah, said. and it made me uh, think too about. Um, I know that there's been work in like modern hunter gatherer populations about the way they use knives, and they tend to like. Put food in their mouth and then cut it from their mouth and it has implications like the on the occlusion of their teeth compared to um mm -hmm. industrialized people and i wonder as they were starting to get these more complex tool assemblages were they changing how they were processing food and did that have impacts on this jaw and this mid face so, you know let's go visit those tribes that wear stuff from their head and scan them yeah <laughs> check whether <laughs> yeah I put a, yeah. So yeah. Michelle, I, I don't know if you knew, uh, I was always interested in that. So I put a link where you can see some uh, tribes in, uh, uh, in Anka. They used to put stones under their skull from very early in age. And so you can see in the pictures uh, the, 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 shape, the shape they got with this kind of uh, deformation. It's kind of impressive. I don't know if you can uh, uh, you can see, but uh, it's kind of yeah. If you can share, yeah, this is really alien shape, uh, and uh, so so I was wondering. Um, so you can do that, but uh, <laughs> we can do that. But I don't know for this kind of person if the 
the cognitive changes they imply doing that. So when you see the occipital part is completely, the, the skull is completely elongated. So I don't know how you, how the functional connectivity is working on this kind of case, but <laughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> it will be good to, to redo that and to see if that, there is implication on that. I mean, uh, I've seen Indiana Jones and there are strong evidence that uh, this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These people are actually aliens. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand even how your fasciculi would be organized. But that with that really extreme one, I think mean, yeah. it's mind blowing. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Good comment. <laughs> uh, we should put them in an MRI scan. No kidding. We might have to wait until we have a portable MRI yeah. Yeah. and a tailored core. It will be cheaper to pay a flight ticket. <laughs> <laughs> right, are there any other questions, comments? No? Okay, in that case, thank you very much for presenting. Very exciting debut on the channel. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> anytime. You're welcome to come back any anytime. Thank you. Um, all right. With that, let me just point you to the fact that we have a wonderful talk coming up this week from Sophie Park on Thursday at 4 p.m. Um, Paris time, that is, on shaping the brain structure and function. So we hope we see you on Thursday for that one. Um, other than that, have an exciting week in science. And we'll see you again next Monday for Neurochino. And I think Abby is presenting next week. I may have talked him into it. <laughs> okay. um, have a wonderful week. See you Thursday.